Hey, good morning, welcome. This is Mastering the Mempool. We're gonna spend 25 minutes going deep into a relatively unexplored part of the blockchain. And uh, there's a bunch of new data, a bunch of new stuff we've never published before that we're gonna be happy to share. And I'll be ho hopefully have some time to take questions at the very end. Um, so we like to make this comparison that traditional transactions, whether you're depositing a check or swiping a credit card or doing an equities trade or shipping a package run like clockwork, they're pretty confidence building. You know what's going on. And like you can take your Swiss watch and turn it over and you can see the movement inside. And while there's a lot of complexity there, it's, it's pretty well organized. And it gives you confidence that, that everything's gonna work according to plan. But, but how many of you have ever done a blockchain transaction before? Okay, yeah, uh -huh. we're at East Denver. Um, it's kind of more like checking your luggage at the airport. You, you hand the transaction over and you have that sort of uneasy feeling like, oh, I hope this is gonna go okay. And then the person who gets it just sort of throws it over their shoulder into some maze of complexity. And then you wait on the other end, refresh, 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 refresh. And most of the time your bag comes out or the transaction and you're like, I'm happy that happened smoothly. But when it doesn't come out, you're like, ah, you know, I got bit by this. And then you go and you talk to someone like, hey, where's my bag? And they go, we don't know where your bag is. It's in the system somewhere, right? And you know, if you are, if you're on vacation and you got to go get a new swimsuit, it's inconvenient. But if you're going for a business meeting or something else, it could be catastrophic, right? And, and therefore, Ethereum transaction anxiety is a real thing. And this is not something which is just for new users. In fact, in our research, what we find is the most experienced users with the most data, with the most at stake, have the biggest issues. Do you guys need something on the, the video feed here? Is there an issue? I'm going to do something here. I'm going to unplug and replug. I spend so much time on these gorgeous slides. Let's hope that they show up. There we go. Um, transaction anxiety is real. And, and you know what? It's OK for us to talk about it. This is, this is a safe space. Okay, We're at East Denver. It's a safe space. And we're going to come back to this theme a lot, because the notion of transa transaction anxiety in our ecosystem does not get anywhere near enough airtime. And as I talk to people, as I talk to investors, this is a very real and deeply problematic aspect of our ecosystem. People are not going to use things that induce anxiety in them, particularly when there's value in motion. Now, how big of a problem is this? Well, interestingly, uh, we did some research in co combination with CoinMetrics, and you can see all this stuff. You're not going to read it all. But believe it or not, since the beginning of time, since the advent of the Genesis block on Bitcoin, there have been 3.1 billion transactions in aggregate, of which 1 .1, or just over 1.1 billion occurred in 2019 alone, or fully 37% of all blockchain transactions across all public chains have occurred about in the last 12 months. We're growing really fast. And in aggregate, this represents $4.6 trillion of value in motion. We spend so much time talking about stuff on chain. On chain, by definition, is value at rest. It's settled, it's confirmed, it's locked, right? It's not changing. The most interesting part of this, we think, or the, and the most interesting opportunities are in the value in motion. And the value in motion is contained by definition in the mempool, okay? And this notion of we have this cache of transactions called the mempool, but it works in this very specific and somewhat unusual way, not very well documented way, not very well explored way, sort of changes everything. And that's what we're here to talk about right now, mastering the mempool. Now, before we get started, <laughs> What the hell is the mempool, right? Now, believe it or not, there's shocking amounts of controversy on this. If you do a Wikipedia search on the mempool, this is what you get. 404 not found. There is no mempool entry in Wikipedia. We have submitted one. It hasn't been approved yet, right? Um, and if you Google Ethereum mempool, you will find effectively not very satisfying results. Now, we just have this definition, shared staging area in front of a blockchain that enables transaction ordering, transaction fee prioritization, and general block construction, right? Except if you go to Geth, it's not called the mempool at all. It's called the transaction pool. And if you go to parity, it's not called the mempool at all, it's called the transaction queue. So we can't even agree about the vocabulary with which to articulate this critical area of our infrastructure. Now, we go across the industry, Bitcoin calls it the mempool, and Libra calls it the mempool, and Tezos calls it the mempool, and pretty much everybody else calls it the mempool. So for our purposes and for the purposes of people understanding what the hell this stuff is, 
we're going to call it the mempool, okay? We're going to acknowledge that different implementations have different terms for it, but we're not here to endorse specific implementations. We're here to talk about important concepts to the ecosystem. And remember, this is a safe space, okay? We're here at ETH Denver. It's a safe space, okay? Okay, so now mastering the mempool, there's another word that requires definition, and it's not the word that you expect. It's the. Because, believe it or not, there's no such thing as the mempool. There is no canonical mempool. There's no master reference mempool. Instead, there are many. In fact, every single node has its own unique instance of the mempool. And if you could read this, it would show that there is about 8,650 8, Ethereum nodes, nodes online as of last night, I think is when I took this screenshot. And every single one has its own unique set of transactions in that, which is determined by a variety of factors, including its peering relationships, its network topology, uh, the, the, the local peering relationships, interesting factors like the Great Firewall of China, the distance between um, uh, nodes, and also the individual settings of each uh, node itself. So geth, this is the default configuration of a geth node, contains 4,096 mempool slots and four gigabytes of memory. What that means, actually the four gigabytes of memory is, is shared, so you actually get less than four gigabytes of memory, is that if you have 4,096 transactions in your pending mempool and your node receives a 4,097th, you drop transactions off the back, okay? And there's all sorts of interesting little settings you can do in here, not so little and not so little, that determine which transactions your local copy of the mempool happens to accept at any given time. Believe it or not, Parity has double the nodes by, double the slots by default, the same amount of memory, and different rules for what governs its queues. So again, the, the tools that you're using to look at a mempool matter quite a bit, okay? Different nodes, different settings, different data. Um, and as a result of this, uh, mempools often miss transactions. Now, what's a missed transaction? It's a transaction that gets written to chain, that's confirmed in a block, that your local copy of the mempool never saw. It literally pops into existence from your perspective and it's confirmed. And then it went into no intermediate state. Now, that's not what actually happened with the, the chain, with the transaction. What actually happened is your copy of the mempool was looking at a different set of transactions. Now, this data is from our own internal network. This is a node, this is a, 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 a cluster of three different nodes running together at the same time. And we basically do this analysis as part of what we, as part of our core operations. And what we find is for a single node in a single geography in a cluster configuration, you're going to miss anywhere from four to eight percent of all transactions, okay? Uh, and so transactions missed in mempool is the percentage over here. It can fluctuate and vary, right? Um, a volume of transactions, actually, sorry, I said that backwards. The orange is the volume, the blue is, it's less than that. But at times you'll see these spikes where you're gonna miss stuff. Now again, what does it matter? It only matters if the transaction you care about is the one that's missed. There's a whole bunch of work that goes into ensuring that uh, you can get full access to all transactions. Furthermore, while transactions are on chain, are immutable, everything in the mempool can be overwritten. So you can overwrite a pending transaction with a replacement transaction, commonly in our space called a speed up or a cancel. And, and this chart right here, again, you can't read it, shows the relative percentage of speed up and cancel transactions in the global mempool at any time. And so most of the time, the orange is cancels. It's like uh, a tenth of a percent. But at certain times, it spikes up to like 8 or 10%. Same thing with speedups. And we watch this behavior. We watch bots go to battle with each other to get confirmed on a block. And they start ratcheting it up each other's, uh, uh, the, the gas price associated or the gas associated with each transaction. And, and to, to do a speed up or a cancel, you, you have to replace a transaction that's currently pending with an identical nonce from the same wallet with at least 10% more gas by default, okay? And so you have this ratcheting behavior where the gas price starts to escalate quite quickly until one of the algorithms nopes out and someone gets that transaction put in. And we see these battles rage. They spike in existence and they spike down. And this creates all sorts of interesting congestion factors in the mempool. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? Um, so remember, there is no canonical mempool. Transaction anxiety is real. Our belief, our assertion, is the root of transaction anxiety is the complexity of this underlying technology. And because this underlying data is not well characterized, not well understood, not well leveraged by builders, it results in an end user and enterprise experience which is like sort of uneasy. 
We toss transactions in, it's value in motion, and we cross our fingers, and this is problematic, okay? Remember, we're in a safe space. Okay, so let's get into the meat of it, mastering the mempool. Um, and uh, this is a real simple day in the life of a transaction. It gets signed, it gets submitted, you wait for a while, hopefully it gets confirmed. Well, this is what a, a transaction in the mempool actually looks like. This is a mempool entry. So you can see at the top the transaction hash, you can see a from address, the gas, the gas price, uh, again the hash, um, the input, which is just a, a call in, the nonce, which is the number eight up there, this is the hex of the nonce, two value, and that's sort of it. It's quite sparse and it's quite compact by design. This is actually derived from the architecture of the Bitcoin mempool, and they were very concerned about keeping everything as small and, and compact as possible. Now, what actually happens in our world, in the world of Ethereum, is there's all this innovation happening to make transactions faster, to make transactions cheaper, to make transactions easier, to make transactions more private. And what they do is they introduce massive amounts of complexity into the nature of transactions and how they're constructed. So now you have all of these factors both happening at layer one and at layer two with smart contract-based wallets and relayers. You have layer two state channels and payment channels. They can get thrown into a mempool that they either wait and you can replace, replace them um, with a speed up or a cancel. And they can have any one of a number of different states or outcomes, some of which are not very well characterized. And you got a lot of transactions pending at any given time. So this is a screenshot I took from Etherscan. They have a, a running graph of this is mempool pending transactions by minute. This is from last night. And this scale is in tens of thousands. So 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. And you can see these massive jumps and then these drops, right, as transactions surge in and out. Now, Keep in mind that in any given moment, there are tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of pending transactions. Um, oh, by the way, each transaction can result in multiple internal transactions. Again, you can't read this, but uh, the, the light blue line is mainnet transactions. The dark above it is resulting internal transactions. And at many moments, uh, the number of internal transactions can be two to five X the volume of mainnet transactions. So when we think about what transactions are actually happening, what's going on here, you have to pay attention to both the, the external transactions and the internal transactions. But for perspective, this is from um, a block chair. This is the average number of transactions in a block. It's measured in hundreds, okay? So you have tens of thousands of pending transactions competing with each other in this mempool where you have this surge activity sloshing in and out to get into one of anywhere from 50 to 150 transactions, maybe a few hundred more transactions per block, right? And by the way, these get written out on a probabilistic basis about every 15 seconds. So in the mempool, you have continuous flow data sloshing in and out, coming constantly, and every 15 seconds, give or take, you get uh, the top of the mempool skimmed off, theoretically. And this results in all sorts of interesting behavior. Um, this is a, a transaction which we noticed last night. Um, it, the gas estimate for this says this should complete in about one hour and 44 minutes. It's been pending for almost five days. This is probably still pending right now. There's a 6,650% discrepancy between the predicted performance of this transaction and the actual performance of this transaction, okay? Now, does it matter? Well, it all depends. Are you buying a house? Is this part of a whole chain of transactions which is expected to complete, or is it some sort of test? And there's no way to know. And as we drive mainstream adoption of these technologies, as we encourage more and more users to do more and more stuff, this, these sorts of incidents become a bigger and bigger headache for the ecosystem, okay? Um, Real-time gas estimation, I won't talk too much about this, is an open loop. We hear about this all the time. It is an incredibly hard problem for uh, the protocols and the dApps out there to accurately give guidance on what a given transaction gas price should be given current real-time mempool considerations. This is, anxiety is real. Again, we're in a safe place. But now, what's nice about this is this mempool data can be enriched. You can actually stretch all of the information out that's contained, and you can get all sorts of useful things that's useful for you as a DAP developer. It's useful for the protocol manufacturers to, man to figure out what's going on with their transactions. It's useful for the end users themselves. So the sparse amount of data which is associated with a mempool transaction can be expanded to include not just from and to, but counterparties, can include the ABI for the individual function calls, can include the internal transactions themselves. Um, these can then be organized into live data feeds. This is an example of the 0x protocol uh, data feed. 
And this transaction visibility can begin to yield transaction confidence. Transaction confidence for you, the builder. Transaction confidence for the people leveraging the tools that you're building. Um, in particular, we're seeing a lot of people using real-time transaction feeds during their development process to have much faster feedback loops to debug their smart contracts, to debug their dApps, right? This is an example, again, you can't read it, of a transaction that failed after 684 seconds, right? Why did it fail? What's going on? And we do a lot of work with our customers to help them understand why the resulting transaction behavior occurred and what changes they can do to improve things, okay? Um, we can take this data, you can use this data, and you can improve the user experience. So rather than expecting the user to pull and pull and search things and understand what's going on in Etherscan, we can just push the information to them and let them know what's going on in their transactions. And we're powering um, push notifications for wallets like Pillar and IDU to tell you as an end user, not just when you're sending uh, value, but when value is coming in and being received. Um, Interestingly, we're helping DeFi protocols benchmark real-world transaction performance. So you, sub, you, you have your DeFi protocol in the wild. People are transacting with it. How long do those transactions take? The reality is they don't know. They have no way to monitor. This is synthetic data that we have um, you know, uh, made up, but this is reflective of real-world work. We had one of the major DeFi protocols approach us and say, we have a target of 30 seconds or less to confirm a transaction, but we don't know how long it actually takes. We help them understand that fully 26% of all transactions against their smart contract were falling below their benchmark. So what? This was more than $10 million of in-flight transactions that were performing below what they expected super eye-opening for them as a protocol. And now that they have visibility and can measure it, they can work on improving this. They can work on improving this by making their, their protocol more efficient. They can work on their uh, gas price estimation, and they can monitor this over time. In the early days of the internet, everyone was so focused on making websites that work. And then people realized faster websites perform better than slower websites, and everyone started to focus on performance. So this data can be used in this regard as well. So in closing, just key takeaways and recommendations. Look, in-flight transactions represent value in motion, which is among the most interesting aspects of our ecosystem. But this anxiety is holding us back, holding us back and, and the secret is in the mempool. Um, you can leverage live mempool data today to build faster, improve your user experience, uh, benchmark your protocol performance, and we believe trigger real-time events. So based on things you're getting off of these data feeds, you can trigger live, dynamic, interactive experiences for your end users and for your infrastructure. And it doesn't need to be difficult. Now, I share all of this, of course, because this is what we do here at Block Native. You can get going with our API in literally less than five minutes. You can be receiving live data in the way that we described in less in five minutes. What should happen here, there's supposed to be a QR code that I put on this slide that's supposed to be part of a game, but we never got it. So there's a game. Come find me later if you want to scan it. Hopefully, we'll get it. But that was Mastering the Mempool. I'm Matt Cutler from Block Native. But I don't know if we have, do we have any time. Are we good? I think we're good. OK, we'll ask some questions. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, what we do is we provide, we, we solve a lot of the challenges that you just saw here. It requires a lot of infrastructure and a, and a, a lot of operational expense. So you can work with us and, and get it for free or by the SIP as opposed to you know, having to build all this infrastructure yourself. Yep. Yes. Oh, it's a very good question. So the bidding wars that happen between bots, basically the miners are incented to prioritize transactions of higher gas price, right? And so the bots are basically competing to get more attention of the miners by increasing the fees associated with their transaction. They're not competing necessarily for the miners' attention, they're competing with each other, right? Because they're trying to be the first one into the next block. And there are certain economic situations that they're looking at, by the way, powered by a lot of this similar data, to try to get economic advantage for doing so. There's a bunch of information asymmetries that are happening in this space. Part of what we're trying to do is eliminate that. We're trying to democratize access to this information because we think it's super valuable for the whole ecosystem. Yep. 
Um, have we seen any evidence of miners prioritizing differently? It's all probabilistic. So this is one of the big challenges. It's not a rule set. So you're going to put it in and you're going to hope that the right thing happens. Um, and, and all I will say is we see weird behaviors, weird transactions, unexpected results, things that have occurred, but we can't explain why they occurred all the time, right? So as you really get into this data set, as you really start looking, there's a lot of anomalous behavior that's happening, and we're trying to surface this as rapidly as we can. We blog about this stuff quite a bit, so if you're curious to learn more about speed ups or cancels, curious to learn more about various aspects of the, the mempool, by all means, check out uh, blog.blocknative.com. Uh, we're just beginning to start publishing some of this data. So I would say we have a, a, a vast amount of data that we ourselves are just beginning to scratch the surface of. In fact, what we find is we don't have all the answers. It's by working with members of the ecosystem that the interesting questions start to surface up. So we're trying to make it as, as easy as possible to get into and start manipulating this data. We don't publish it yet at a macro archive letter level, but that's something that we plan to do as a mempool explorer-like functionality. Um, um, but uh, again, we're, we're early in the cycle, and we want to invite everybody to, to come in and check it out. Okay? Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great ETH Denver. It's a safe space.